All right. We are in the synopsis of a pure earth theology, and we're looking at paragraph 15 of uh, Disputation 7 uh, this week. We're looking at the personhood of the Son and the Spirit is, is the uh, easy way to say that. What's a slightly more technical way to say it? The um, subsistence? Yeah, it's the first part of the definition that we looked at last time. Uh, Leiden is just bringing uh, in some proofs from Holy Scripture that make us confident that it's true to say, in the case of Son and Holy Spirit particularly, who we might have some doubts about, that indeed they subsist. Um, they're going to be given some essentially proof texts, uh, though not exactly proof texts, some, some more difficult arguments from the authority of Holy Scripture that are really interesting and helpful to get us to uh, apprehend this truth. Great. All right. So let's look at that. Uh, paragraph 15. Um, next, that subsistence must be ascribed to the Son and Holy Spirit, as well as to the Father, may be gathered from the fact that nouns, as well as actions, which belong to self-subsistent individuals, are attributed to them. Maybe we just say something about that before we get to the actual nouns and verbs or nouns and actions um, that uh, Polyander uh, and the Leiden synopsis are going to list here. Um, how would you prove the Son and Spirit are persons in the sense of that they subsist distinctly? Um, the answer is, well, you would consult Holy Scripture, and if you find that they receive nouns, names, titles uh, that pick them out and treat them as somebody, um, and if you find them undertaking the kinds of actions that are personal actions that could only be attributed to subsistences, then that would be your evidence. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, maybe putting it a bit more technically, um, you know, we want to be uh, affirming these, uh, these, these predicates, to put, put it technically, like subsistence of Son and Holy Spirit in a proper rather than like a metaphorical way mm. and um in the technicality of like scholastic theology which is running the background here for reformed orthodox there are various ways that you can say something is the case and particularly here it's uh, properly and formally affirming subsistence of son and holy spirit also affirming that of them eternally mm. so we're, we're going to be given uh proofs that um we might say rest on contingent actions, contingent names, various things like that. The goal here is not to make the claim that they are persons only because of created states of affairs or something like that, but rather to uh, use those created states of affairs um, to know that they are persons, uh, specifically etern eternally, but this is the typical way that Holy Scripture speaks and i really appreciate the parallelism or the equality of our affirmation of subsistence to son and holy spirit as such is predicated or affirmed of the father so that's that's the bar they're equal according to their subsistence this also adverts us back to the fact that although we are speaking of father son holy spirit as distinct mm -hmm. these predications are grounded upon a common divine essence and I think that's another issue we're going to run run into here is we need to make sure we're not thinking we're concluding to three separate individuals, each having their own substance or something like, like that. Um, the kinds of proofs that we're using merely get us to conclude that if the persons are distinct, then they do subsist uh, mm. as such, giving various proofs from Holy Scripture. So I really like that. And then the the two the two uh avenues of proofs being names and acts uh, specifically transitive acts mm. here um, are being yeah. used for purpose that's good i think it's important to um so you kind of tag the base of the one divine essence which we've already has already been treated in a previous disputation you know you start from biblical monotheism um and a treatment of god but then also that you're sort of extending personhood from the father who anchors it conceptually to the Son and Spirit. So it's not, let's do this one. Now let's go over here and do this one separately. Now let's move to the third one. It's you begin with the Father. The subsistence of the Father is not in doubt. 
and now you argue from Scripture to extend recognition of subsistence to the Son and the Spirit. And, and that's very much the structure of this way of arguing. Yeah, and the, and the proof isn't rocket science. I mean, it's it's it basically amounts to Holy Scripture treats the Father, uh, or, or excuse me, he treat, it, it treats the Son and Holy Spirit in similar ways to how it treats the, the Father. Yeah, um, these are really common arguments that we all learn in Sunday school, and that's because <laughs> Sunday school is often really great. Uh, yeah, look at the the common names that are ascribed to all three persons. Look at the common also personal actions that are ascribed to all three persons. We're right to conclude from this biblical evidence that they are equal according to being subsistent. Um, so they're equally subsistent, or it's equally true and right to predicate subsistence thereof. Yeah. Um, so one more thing I want to kind of tease apart before we jump into the proof itself. Um, you said that the way this functions is to show that if they are distinct, then they subsist. Is that, is that how you said that? Can, can you, yeah, can some, you explain that a little more? more? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really just pushing the, the, the line that subsistence here in a number of these elements of the above definition that we looked at last time mm -hmm. are grounded upon divine essence. Um, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are persons because they are God. Mm -hmm. They're distinct persons because they're distinct. And elements of this definition, things like autotheos, and, um, which is looming the background, you can very quickly confuse your lines. Of what are we talking about here? Are we talking about how the persons are distinct or how they're persons, how they subsist, these various different types of questions and we can get our lines crossed. So okay. um, these proofs uh, essentially also work for proving that all three persons are God. Hmm. And I find it rather fascinating that the function of these types of authorities and what they're aiming to prove about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is rather different than what we would classically like in the medieval period among the patristics use these types of proofs for mm -hmm. we would use the ascription of lord and god and all these different divine names of of also son and holy spirit not because whether their persons is in question but simply because whether they are god is in question mm -hmm. so we already assume that they're distinct but the question is are they divine persons you know what i mean so yeah it's a very different a uh, way of directing the biblical data for different ends. And I think right. that can be misleading if we if we don't understand that it's merely to get us to conclude rather than to explain how they are uh, persons, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So somebody might look at this evidence and say, we're going to use this to prove that the um, Holy Spirit exists uh, as a separate person. And I would say, okay, please never say separate. Uh, person is good, but if I'm going to be fussy here, I also don't want to prove that the Holy Spirit exists. I need to start with the one God and prove that the Holy Spirit subsists as the one God in this person, mm -hmm. right? And that's even if you don't have any strong commitment to what the technical term subsist means, just to even hold it in your mind as it's different from just exists, right? The, a, a separate entity could exist. That's not what I'm trying to get insight into here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then paragraph 16 starts into the proof itself, uh, the appeal to scripture. For by means of the title Lord, which is appropriate to a subsistent person, Holy Scripture designates not only the Father and the Son, but also the Holy Spirit. This is evident from the comparison of these two parallel texts, Isaiah 6, 8 and Acts 28, 25. But the names of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are only appropriate to subsistent persons, Matthew 28, 19. So um, just to read the passages that they're setting up in parallel, um, Isaiah 6, 8 is, of course, Isaiah's throne vision and his commission. Um, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Um, and then I said, here I am, send me. Okay. Um, so that's, keep that in mind. I should say that the word Lord there is Adonai rather than the divine name Yahweh. Um, so it's, um, it's Lord as a title rather than the revealed divine name. And then Acts 28, um, 25 is very into the book of Acts. Um, 
Paul says, um, I'm sorry, have I got the right verse here? 28, 25. Oh, right. So Paul's about to quote this commission to Isaiah, go to this people and say, you will hear, but you will not understand. But he prefaces it, this reference to uh, Isaiah 6 by saying, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people. So it's the Isaiah 6 commission <laughs> passage spoken by the Lord, which uh, Paul cites and says, uh, the Lord... I saw the Holy Spirit was right in saying this. So pretty easy proof by cross-reference there. Yeah, yeah. nice. Um, I like the the use of both common names, such as Lord, and then proper names. Um, and one of the things that these disputations are intended to be is um, really short uh, summary, even almost outline points. Mm. So, um, you know, a common name such as Lord is said... And then slot all the other common names you can find. This is how we handle them. This is what we do with them as being exemplified. And then we also have proper names. So I like the I like the adequate division. Mm. Um, and I think that the 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 kind of underlying assumption here, in my opinion, is a bit obscured in the translation. the The point is that the common name among creatures, which is Lord, uh, regularly signifies a subsistent person. So I go out and you know I'm in old English times and I say I say Lord so and so I'm I'm regularly referring to a subsistent person and mm -hmm. therefore it's usage of each one of these supposed individuals who are in question Father Son Holy Spirit likewise indicates that and it's also the same kind of logic underlying calling somebody Father calling somebody Son um, a little bit weaker as we know calling somebody Holy Spirit uh, it's not really something we do Holy Spirit is always troublesome. Um, but nonetheless, a kind of basic logic applies. Yeah, good. And that, that's helpful to point out that when Leiden says the title Lord is appropriate to a subsistent person, um, that's not yet theology proper. That's the analogical basis. That's like 100%. if I call someone Lord, I'm not talking to, I don't know, a book or the DMV or something. You know, <laughs> it's a it's a title for a, a person, a subsistent person. Yeah, and even even more so, there might be some some heavy Aristotle in the background here, or, or Thomas. Um, Lord is deeply connected with rationality. So to be rational is to be Lord of oneself, is mm. by definition. So that might even be why the particular name Lord is being used here in the context of person, um, because it it doesn't just mean individual, mm -hmm. like a dog is an individual but it specifically means an individual rational nature naming the person. So I find that interesting it's a possible background here. Oh, that is helpful. Um, not, not so curios, dominus, Lord, sovereign, um, all of these things, not just in the sense of raw power, like, oh, you have mm -hmm. this might, but in the sense of, um, I don't know, mastery, self-mastery, self yeah. intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Say yeah. Self-possession, self-consciousness. Yeah. Good. Um, and that this is extended to Father, not only Father, but also Son and Holy Spirit. And I think then the cross-reference proof from Isaiah 6, 8 to 28, 25 specifically picks out the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. um, as if Leiden's kind of skipping over the Son. Like, Father's obvious. It also applies to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let me show you that by referring to the Holy Spirit. So if these are talking points and you're expanding them in class, you might include a little extension to the sun there. Um, unless I'm missing the sun yeah. secretly hiding in Isaiah 6, 8 in this cross-reference. I think you're exactly right. And I'm, I'm, I, I think it's probably because, yeah, father is obvious. The sun is also so frequently called this. It's obvious. Like uh, your normal Bible student should be able to come up with references in the gospels or in Paul's literature for, yeah. for descriptions of the Lord. Holy Spirit might be a little bit more difficult and, yeah, Not all good. of us have Act 28, 25 memorized. Yeah, right. That's right. You could easy, easily drop in Psalm 1101, the Lord said to my Lord, right. you know, Yahweh said to my Adonai. Um, yep. And and there, Jesus cites that text and says, how is David's son also David's Lord? So lordship mm -hmm. isn't there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, and then the last sentence of paragraph 16. Um, but the names, the names, we're not talking about titles here, but names, mm -hmm. the names of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are only appropriate to subsistent persons. Um, and that was what you were talking about earlier with the common uh, 
common titles and particular personal names. Yeah, and you know, I always find it helpful to think of these as technically speaking in terms of like our logic and what we're actually asserting here to think of these as lower case in actuality. So we know that they they are actual individual persons, which is why we uppercase them and out of reverence and all of that, just like we do for any 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 titles or forms of address. But technically speaking, when in Latin or in scholastic literature, we speak of names or nomina, mm. that's the same thing as saying predicates. So God is wise, wise is a name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, here are all names or predicates, and therefore, in the technicality of what's being said, they're lowercase predicates that are being ascribed to the person's uppercase, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, th this really comes into play when you have someone like St. Thomas asking whether the Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's like, okay, weird <laughs> question, bro. What is this yeah. saying? Whether we're predicating what Holy Spirit means of the individual whom we pick out with uppercase Holy Spirit. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's good. So you, in English. Yeah. Yeah. You could print this, you could translate this. Um, but the names of single quotation mark lowercase father, yep. single quotation mark son, you know, lowercase son, to, to point out that we're talking about the term mm -hmm. and not the actual person by their calling them by their name. Talking about right. their name instead of calling them by their name. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good. Um, and then just one other thing about this Matthew 28, 19 appeal. I've I've been seeing this all over the church fathers uh, in my recent reading. I just did a bunch of Basil and Gregory Nyssa, and they constantly come back to this as this is this is the triad, this is the three, and it would be inappropriate to lump the father who is the person who is God with the son if you think he's a creature. That's going to make that's a that's a bad foundation for a triad. You have you're just failing a set theory if you mm -hmm. have a set that includes the real God, a creature, or then when you get to the Holy Spirit, a force or an import impersonal poetic way of talking about God in action. Or if it's two guys and a bird, or if there's any way a lopsided triad, you just can't have it. You know that these mm -hmm. these go together as three names that serve in the same way to pick out three uh, subsistent persons. Yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah the, the logic there is even like you're you're absolutely right with like basic basic grouping, but the fact that God doesn't fall in a group. Mm. Kind of the, the underlying yeah. logic that we always point out, God doesn't share his glory with another. And therefore, by virtue of there being an a, an apparent sharing of glory, we know they're all one according to that glory. There is not a there's not a uh, glory here, glory here, glory. There's one glory, one essence and all that. Yeah. 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 With, if um, it'd be fun to dig a little deeper into Matthew 28, 19, because the, the text says baptize in the name singular mm -hmm. of, and then it goes through these three, which in this context, Leiden is calling each of the three a name, right? The, the mm -hmm. name of uh, the names, plural. But in context, of course, there's a statement about the name of, it doesn't say the names of. So mm -hmm. yeah, that can all, that all goes together nicely. It's not a problem to solve, but uh, something to dig into a little more. Mm -hmm. All right, paragraph 17. We're moving now from titles and names to um, actions, in particular, personal actions. Personal actions are to appear before someone, to charge a certain duty uh, by one's command, to assume the seat of Abraham, to take on the appearance of a dove. It's, it's a little list. <laughs> um, I guess it's presented as if at random, but then, then they work through it. The first mm -hmm. of these, depicted in Isaiah 6, 8, is assigned both to the son, John 12, 14. Uh, uh, he saw his glory. And to the Holy Spirit, Acts 28, 25. This is the cross-reference we already saw. Mm -hmm. um, and the second, that is to say... Um, Assuming the seed of Abraham. To assume the seed of Abraham is assigned only to the son, Hebrews 2, 16. The third, only to the Holy Spirit, Matthew 3, 16. Uh, take on the appearance of a dove. Yeah. So actually, there's that. There's the um, unspoken son in the Isaiah reference. Um, the the son is present in Isaiah six by cross reference to John twelve fourteen. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> I I'm I'm just very curious on the usage of the Acts twenty eight twenty five. Again, like it's not the first 
I'm, I mean, I'm not the quickest on, on my Bible references, but it's not the first reference I've reached to. And I just wonder if there's some interesting exegetical tradition here among the reform usage of Acts 28, 25. Yeah, that would be interesting. I know um, Hebrews is well interpreted this way, too. You have statements, you know, where God or the Lord says something in the Old Testament, and then Hebrews will cite it as the Holy Spirit bears witness, or the it turns out the Father was speaking to the Son. So there's kind of a retrospective um, prosopanic exegesis, you know, where the New Testament use unpacks for you who was talking. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Anything else there? The the Holy Spirit, or sorry, the um assuming the seed of Abraham um is specifically that incarnational passage of Hebrews 2.16. The context is the the son doesn't lay hold of um the seed of uh doesn't lay hold of angels, but lays hold of the seed of Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. I like the contrast between assuming seed of abraham here assuming human nature versus putting on form of dove so there's oh. a there's there's a very strong contrast here between the uh effects the respective effects involved in the respective visible missions of son versus holy spirit i know you've thought a lot about that fred yeah yeah that's nicely done i hadn't thought about emphasizing as this passage would the personal actions so to assume i think the greek there is epilambano to to take on or to to take hold of in order to help it's the same greek word that's translated um hug or embrace um mm -hmm. elsewhere in the new testament so uh but of course in the context of hebrews too it's not just that the son of god hugs the seed of abraham but takes it to himself and this passes through greek patristic usage into a very much a technical term for the assumption of the human nature mm -hmm. um, whereas that is not what we have with the, the the visible mission of the spirit making use of the dove as a sign as a visible sign it's not yes. a yeah not an incarnation or an indivation or you know what would that be in columbation i don't know what you'd call that <laughs> um, yeah i mean stop now before before you respond to new heresy um but yes yeah. It's not that, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we don't need a name for it because that's not what's happening. Um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, there, there's a lot of really, really, really important um, theology that runs along along these th this difference here. Um, the difference between the revelation uh, that accrues, bad word here, but via human nature. Um, mm. Sometimes we can't think of Ronner and, and, you know, he, he did good stuff too. Um, but that's not going to be the case uh, in, in in terms of the dove. And often it's pointed out here that the Holy Spirit assumes as a dove, the form as of a dove, mm -hmm. uh, whereas we don't have that those kinds of sayings with respect to the son. Only we, we can say properly the son is man, but we cannot mm -hmm. say properly the Holy Spirit is dove. That's, that's a no-go, which is why biblical language, uh, you know, speaks differently about this this various taking up because it's a different kind of taking up um, yeah, yeah yeah good so the elliptical nature of the phrase take on the appearance of a dove is mm -hmm. uh, it's not as direct as the incarnation yeah. even if you compare the um account of the baptism in the jordan in the synoptic gospels and of course there's also a reference to it in john not a narrative but a reference um it's it's kind of unusual you know whether whether the text says that the spirit descended in the form of a dove or um a, the you know the a dove descended it's it's a little loose you kind of have to lay all three of them together and say there's something something is clearly being claimed here about the dove and the mm -hmm. holy spirit but it can be stated in different ways so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah good okay well i think that's the personal actions and of course you get the sense that while these examples were carefully chosen and laid out in a particular sequence, um, you do get this sense that many others could also be provided uh, to point to personal actions being taken by what can only be um, subsistent persons. Yeah. All right, so then paragraph 18. The second point we make in a description of the divine persons is that it possesses intelligence and consequently volition. It, oh wait, are we, yeah, we're going to do 18, aren't we? Or we're going to stop here. Well, I we can go on to 18. Um, that starts the second point of the definition. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. And and starts the next section. Uh, it might be great to introduce it here uh, as we 
as we move back from proving the parts of the definition to uh, considering each part. Okay, yeah. Um, so it possesses intelligence and consequently volition. It is evident that this applies equally to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from the fact that everywhere in the Holy Book, the Son and the Holy Spirit are awarded the same descriptions of wisdom, knowledge, truth, counsel, and goodwill as the Father is, as in Proverbs 8, Isaiah 12, John 14, 17, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, etc. Hmm. Yeah, I like this. Um, I, I like this uh, thesis. It's kind of a catch-all thesis. Um, as far as everything to do with intelligence and, and and willing, so knowledge and love, right? Everything to do with knowledge and love. These are um, persons in the in the fullest sense of the term. Um, in fact, if you recall Boethius's definition, um, this gets us to adequately affirming personality of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we had subsistence. Uh, specifically of a rational nature. So that's the second point. And then third and following are going to be Richard St. Victor's uh, definition. Mm. But for me, again, this thesis underwrites the fact that these are common names that are grounded upon essence talk. We can't think of three centers of consciousness, mm -hmm. things like that, that we might be tempted to when we're proceeding in this kind of fashion and say, oh, they all, they all are wise. They all are loving. Yes, they are, but they are that each as the one God, not in the personal line whereby they're distinct, where we can say one, two, three. Yeah, or or um, you could also say, yeah. So so you're you're moving back towards the um, cognition, volition, intelligence of the one God, mm -hmm. um, and your the task is to demonstrate that the Son and the Spirit possess that subsist as that um uh, just as much as the father does so that's kind of the standard of proof is you know can can we are we right to recognize the son and the holy spirit as being personal in the same sense that the father is mm -hmm. but what we're not doing is talking about the relation among them so when you get to volition for instance you wouldn't say does the son have his own volition over against and in relation to the father's own volition that working around the is not part of the uh, Athanasian creed diagram uh, is not what's going on here. This is just mm -hmm. digging deeper into grounding personhood in the uh, essence of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, um, I think we can probably park this conversation right there. And when we come back, we'll be ready to take on the third thing that the Leiden synopsis draws from its definition of personhood. Great. All right. See you then.